try it again. Okay. Yeah. I'm Renee Forrestal and a painter and art educator in Halifax. Tell me about your work. So, um, what I've been doing the last year, I guess, I, I've, got, I've been painting a long time. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know when I started. Right? So all my life, and I was brought up in that kind of environment where we were painting all the time. Our bedrooms were our studios and stuff like that. But um, I went through some changes around eight years ago when my mother died. Uh, I had done a lot of work that was along um, the lines of exploring all of the various traditions of painting. Um, it used to be that classical painters were trained in anatomy and iconography and uh, figure drawing and all these things. When I went to art college in the 80s, we were pretty much given a typewriter and told, do text art, do political art, and this is what it's all about. Painting is dead. Uh, figure drawing is dead. All of these things are dead. You need to do conceptual art and all this other stuff. So. I wasn't so happy with that because I had always wanted, I, I'm a painter, just, you know, 2D, I'm flat, I like oil, that's my thing, anyway. So I spent uh, time in the 80s exploring oil painting and various uh, techniques and technical things and trying to get a grasp on what oil paint was about through various teachers. I had Ron Shubrook and uh, John Clark, who were amazing teachers at NASCAD, and um, very kind and, and understanding uh, mentors. And uh, I had some that weren't so kind or understanding, but they were quite nurturing. And then, of course, I had my family and my father and my mother, who was also an art educator. And um, my mother was also a painter. She painted in oil and very different kind of paintings than my dad. Um, and a lot of siblings that were in art. So I had a lot of supports at home and you know, in that environment. Anyway, um, after, uh, after many years of exploration, I, I had uh, done lots of different things. I studied anatomy and did, uh, studied icono traditional iconography and how to grind pigments and make my own paint with egg tempera. And, um, I have a few laying around, but some at, most of them are home. And I did, you know, photorealism and a whole variety of things because to me, any kind of painting is good. <laughs> any kind of painting is great. I, I love anything that's done with paint um, from any period in art history. And uh, I just, uh, and on just any level of, of effort, I think, as an art educator, I put it in the context of, you know, people's, uh, you know, it's, we're connected with a whole history going back to the cave, you know, uh, we're connected as art educators and artists, and it's part of our human drive to create, to make our mark, and, you know, to, to start splitting hairs about whether you're doing it in this fashion or that fashion, which was really how I was educated at NASCAD, that some painting was intelligent, some wasn't, and, um, you know, and, some things were political and some weren't, and some things were worth pursuing and some weren't. And there's a lot of judgment attached to painting. Okay? And I didn't really like that part of it. <laughs> um, uh, so I really just wanted to pursue having an experience, I think, with every possible type of painting, including, you know, high realism, abstraction, and everything in between. So, at one point, uh, before my, uh, about eight years ago, my mother died, and that, uh, I guess, triggered a whole bunch of things, that, that uh, uh, questions of where I was going and what I was doing with my painting, and you know, I ended up changing studios many times, like three or four times, until I finally landed here at Wonderneath, and I just... I love it. <laughs> the uh, people here are absolutely fantastic, very supportive environment to be painting in. And, um, and then I just started exploring things and feeling, a, a, I guess, a type of freedom of being alone and 
trying to reintegrate everything I'd ever learned about paint and painting and um, I guess still trying to just work with the feeling of painting and, uh, and art. So some of the paintings that are here in the room are just based on that um, explorations of I guess places uh, places, they're all places that mean something to me or are um, images that um, I guess um, I don't know were ideas that I was thinking about so for instance this little one here this painting not little really but uh, it's uh, a background of uh, a park that I walk in every day around where I live, the Frog Pond. And this funny building that's there is actually called the Futuro House. And last year I had been um, talking, I had been looking on Kijiji to see if I could buy one of these houses. And so I was imagining how this would look in my neighborhood. And <laughs> anyway, how you know, this uh, funny uh, Futuro House might look. And the purpose of this was, I was trying to think of like a studio, like how I could maybe have a studio in the backyard for Marie and I to share that was closed because I like living with my painting. The only problem with here, I love it here, but the only problem is that I like to wake up and paint for a couple of hours, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, maybe at four in the morning and this, not having a studio in your house is kind of a little difficult that way. So I was trying to figure out ways maybe if I could have one in the backyard, and I started exploring the idea of micro houses. And um, none of these have micro houses in them right now, but they're all kind of setting. Is that a real house in Halifax, or is that, that a, a tiny house that you've researched? It's uh, there used to be uh, a few of them in the Maritimes. There were only a hundred made, ever, and um, uh, that one was actually in Maine, and I had a, and they were selling it for I can't remember how many thousands, a few thousand. And, I had it, I, I figured it out how to get this thing taken apart and I'd get it on a truck and brought to the uh, river and put on a barge and then floated to Port, or not Portland, uh, yeah Portland, and then it would be put on a container and brought to Halifax, but that was, and it, I thought well you know the whole thing would only probably cost about three or four thousand dollars to have it moved, but then uh, as I looked into it further the problem with the building was that it was um, in, in the physical, um, I guess, neglect, it, the whole thing would have to be redone because they were made of fiberglass and these had been sitting out in the elements without a coating since, you know, maybe the 80s. So um, the coating, on, when that comes off fiberglass, it starts to really deteriorate and go to a powder. So you'd have to ream the whole thing down. Yeah. So that's like a, hello, how are you guys? We you like your little arrow, we're gonna copy you. Oh, <laughs> good idea. This, um, that's my sign down there, and this is, uh, yeah, that's hers. Anyway, that's Millie, who comes sometimes. <laughs> and then this is, uh, this is my eyes bill, because the people in the neighborhood call it the eyes. See the eyes? Eyes bill, and there's the eyes, because they call it eyes bill. Instead of eyes bill. Formal elements in the painting that would be, um, uh, that would hold the painting or move it to another place. Show so, me. for instance, this one here has got all kinds of formal stuff going on in it. Um, it's got the rule of thirds. So this dotty business down below, first of all, it's a snow scene, that a picture I took while I'm doing, while I was doing a recess or after recess lunch hour duty or whatever at the grammar school where I teach. And it was in the winter and all the kids had just kind of gone in so you can see all their footprints all over the snow. That's what all that stuff is. And that's their little play section. And then there's some trees behind the fence over there. And this white stuff was just uh, using those bende dots. I just have really enjoyed the kind of idea of using these in a kind of organic way. So they're not like all machined, but they're, they're, there's some structure, but they're not machined. What kind of dots? So, 
Bende dots are called. Bende, like um, this stuff here, it's like in the 60s and the 70s uh, Roy Lichtenstein started to use uh, those, like, and they were, they were part of the print print method, you know, for newspapers and things like that. I see what you're saying. Um, I think as a culture we've become accustomed to looking at them and they they mean something else now and they're part of a design uh, I don't know design ideas in, in art that um, I just like the way they look I like the way they add a kind of a, a bit of machine but not too much <laughs> so there's order it creates a structure and order to something that could be a little chaotic so I'm trying to impose a little bit of structure uh, to this chaos. <laughs> um, so there's this white bende dot thing going on and then snow and then this little building but the point is that the picture is divided into thirds so one, two, three and that kind of corresponds with the rule of thirds in art that you know, this geometry principle that you know this is supposed to be the you know, pleasing compositions. Then they're also divided this way into thirds. So there's this blue down, band down the middle, and there's this section, that section. And then there's some odd scattered about things, so little bits of orange here and there that bring your eye around. And then there's another uh, formal things going on, the rule of um, two thirds, one third, and touch of. Okay, so that's in color theory or tonal theory. Like if you're putting putting that into a painting, you'd have um, two thirds, like in this case, it's like if you blur your eyes and you look at it, it pictures like two thirds light colors, so this sort of creamy light colors. So you could say two thirds white or whatever. Uh, well, yeah, two thirds that, one third sort of mid tones, right, in that brownie stuff, you know, and that and that bluish stuff, and then a touch of fluorescent. What is that painting called? Uh, I don't know. Have a name, but grammar, right, right now I just call it the grammar school snow, you know, snow at the grammar school playground. I don't know, there's no name for it really.